Good morning, Grant. Morning. How are you? Good. Uh, I'm Sarah Posner with Religion Dispatches, and today I'm talking with Grant Galico, of, uh, who's associate editor at Commonweal Magazine. And we're going to talk about Catholicism and the presidential campaign, which is something that uh, I've written a little bit about and Grant has written a lot about. Uh, but I wanted to just start with the vice presidential debate last week, uh, which drew the attention of religion and religion and politics reporters because obviously both the vice presidential candidates are Catholic. Right. Um, and you know, before before the debate, the Family Research Council put out a Catholic voter guide, which is sort of hilarious because the Family Research Council is not a Catholic organization. Um, and they put was out it a capital C or a lowercase. <laughs> <laughs> it was with a capital C, right? And uh, and they put out a voter guide which uh, claimed to assess the uh, authentic Catholicism of the of the two candidates. You know, and of course, it came out. You know, uh, Paul Ryan came out smelling like a rose, and Joe Biden did not, surprisingly, right? Um, but everybody was watching the debate to see if Martha Raddatz was going to ask some question that somehow related to the two candidates' very sort of disparate interpretations of their faith. Um, and, of course, the question was not about anything else but abortion. Right, and she she did it in this way that, you know, it, it wasn't just like a policy question. It was like, can you speak, you know, to your, the role that your faith plays in your yeah. abortion policy? So which, it would which, seem like a weird stacked question. Well, it, it kind of drove me crazy because as you know, I mean, I don't think that the candidates should use their faith as a way of deflecting support from their opponents or bolstering support for themselves. I mean, you, you know, your faith is not something a candidate should wear on their sleeve in order to uh, garner voters' uh, appreciation for how, how faithy they are. Uh, and the reality is, you know, what either of these men think about their church's views on abortion has no bearing on whether... Uh, abortion should be legal or not. I mean, it was just sort of like their personal interpretation of the Catholic Church's teaching on this. It was just such a uh, annoying way, way yeah, to I mean, I wish, the question. It's strange because, you know, the, Paul, Paul Ryan, who's, you know, a church-going Catholic like Joe Biden, mm -hmm. um, and, and who's, you know, who's never shied away from trying to articulate the way his uh, religious beliefs influence his policies. But he... And he didn't make what what's a very common argument uh, from Catholics about this this issue, which is that um, you know the, what the what the church what the Catholic Church says is that it, it's not simply a, a matter of Catholic theology uh, that that causes the, the the church to teach against abortion. It's a, it's actually a question of uh, natural law, and I I was sort of expecting Paul Ryan to kind of make that pivot. You know, say that as you know, that my my church teaches that abortion is wrong, but it's not simply a question of, of Catholic theology. But from the Catholic Church's point of, point of view, it's just a it's a it's a question of common human reason, and that's the, that's what you know that's the kind of that that that's how I was expecting him to pivot into the into the policy question. But the way that Raditz framed it, it kind of hemmed both candidates in to kind of talk personally. I mean, she said that um, in her sort of. You know, right, um, right, and and that weird that, question, and right. and so they both kind of had to retreat immediately to the way you know they personally believe, um, which is something that drives a lot of conservative Catholics crazy, a lot of a, a lot of liberal Catholics crazy, who you know, people who think that um, the Mario Cuomo approach to abortion policy um, is just kind of a dodge, uh, mm -hmm. and and that's the, that's the kind of criticism that, that Biden received after the fact. Now, when you talk about it, something that it drives liberal liberal Catholics crazy, are you talking so, about liberal pro-life Catholics or liberal pro-choice Catholics? Um, probably, probably both. I mean, you know, I I, I know liberal pro-choice Catholics, um, you know, who probably favor um, much more uh, restricted abortion access than the Democratic Party faithful. Um, but they but they they would also have a problem with just the the kind of you know this is what I believe personally, but it doesn't affect my policy kind of you know I, I think um, 
you know, Cuomo took and continues to take a lot of heat for, for, for that. And, and that it was really his speech um, at Notre Dame uh, in the late 80s, I think, maybe the mm -hmm. early 90s, uh, that kind of, you know, launched that sort of argument. And, and, and what and was his for, precise you know, phrasing? Do you remember what his precise phrasing was? Sorry? What, what the exact phrasing that, that Cuomo used? I don't remember the exact yeah. phrasing. I mean, it was very similar to, to Biden's. Right, the personal um, versus what I would impose on other people. Right, yes. I mean, and, and you, you can see how, um, you know, from the electorate's point of view, you know, from the average person watching the television, I mean, that, that's, I mean, maybe for most voters, that's a, that's a very appealing way to frame it because in the American political tradition, uh, at least as it's practiced today, um, you know, you're, you're not supposed to say that um, your personal religious views uh, can influence policy that would govern people who don't adhere to those views. Right. Well, and well, what's interesting, I think that the, both parties have hemmed their candidates in, in in this regard, right? Because on the one hand, you have, you know, sort of the JFK view of the world, right. uh, view of the religion and politics world, right? But then since that time, since since JFK's, you know, separation of church and state speech, uh, there's been a concerted effort, first by the Republican Party, um, to create an environment where it's required of candidates to talk about how their faith influences their policy, and in fact to portray faith and policy as being inextricably intertwined with one another, because if you don't have faith, how can you have uh, right. uh, policy that's okay. Um, well, and then what you saw in the, in the mid 2000s with the Democrats trying to push back on this, you know, Republicans owning religion mm -hmm. idea is that they started to promote this idea that yes, you know, voters really want to hear about a candidate's faith. If they don't hear about a candidate's faith, they don't know that they're religious. And then they question whether, what their values are. And so the Democrats have kind of hemmed themselves into a corner where they're like, they have to talk about their faith, but then they, it, it, then you, what you're saying is if they talk about their faith, but they say their faith is disconnected from their policy decisions, then voters don't believe them. But I don't, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I just wonder <clears throat> how many voters really want to hear how devout Joe Biden or Paul Ryan are. Versus want to hear, well, you know, where do you just tell me where you come down on the abortion question in a policy arena? Well, I, I mean, for the Democrats, um, I think in the, you know, the way that they decided to shift um, and you're not seeing it that much in this particular cycle, no, but in, right. in, in yeah. 2008, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a very, uh, very strenuous effort to um, connect with uh, religious voters, especially Catholic voters. Um, and part of that, I think, you know, you saw the exit polls uh, after Kerry lost, and it seemed like every single religious voter uh, uh, went for, for Bush. And so the Democrats, I think, um, you know, in a kind of mercenary way that you have to, uh, you know, the, the way that you have to approach winning votes, they decided they were going to make, a, you know, a stronger effort. And so they did. And in some ways, they were reclaiming um, the kind of historic connection between the Democratic Party and the Catholic Church pre Roe versus Wade, um, you know, the kind of labor priests, the, the, the social justice efforts that, um, that linked the, the church with a lot of, um, policies of the democratic party. And so in this, in this cycle, it's, you know, it's, it seems like the Obama campaign has decided to kind of slow down its religious outreach. Um, and, and it's, it's a really interesting bet that, that they're making. Um, you know, first I, you know, maybe three or four months ago, I was pretty sure that Obama wasn't going to win the Catholic vote, and and his strategy was basically to go for um, women uh, and uh, voters who supported gay marriage and voters, um, you know, voters who were uh, you know closer to nuns than uh, any than N, -N, 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 -N -E. um not N U N. But now, you know, the most recent polling is showing that 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 Catholics in swing states have kind of started to tilt toward Obama. Um, well, you know, I, I don't think that there's a lot of evidence that, I mean, I, I don't know that there's evidence that the increased religious outreach that the Democrats engaged in in 2006 and 2008 
was actually the cause of them winning. I think that it's really hard to figure out whether that was the cause of them winning, right? Because oh, yeah, do I mean, there's, these no, voters, there's no way to, to say for right. sure. It's, it's yeah, just we that, don't know whether there, you know, there were other factors that led to those victories, just like there were other factors that led to Democratic House losses in the midterms in 2010. And so there were some uh, strategists, political operative types, who claimed, who who promote this idea that the Democrats should talk about their faith more, who said that the losses were due to the Democrats not talking about their faith. But it's like, well, you know, there were a lot of other things going on in 2010 other than the Democrats not talking about their faith. But I always, I always thought, I always wondered and, and, and hypothesized, actually, that that the, the very voters that you're talking about, someone who would be responsive to a sort of social justice sort of message, uh, even if not framed in an overtly religious way, would be responsive to democratic messaging uh, or democratic uh, outreach to religious voters. I mean, it, it could be an outreach to religious voters in terms of like they maybe maybe had gone to uh, an event that featured religious, you know, a conference or something that featured a religious angle on it all, right? But it wasn't an overtly religious appeal, right? It was just an appeal like, you know, right. Here's our economic message. You, social justice Catholic voters, you take it or leave it, but we're not going to sit around and talk about how devoutly Christian we are. Here's our economic message. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, and I don't think that's the kind of voter um, who's being targeted by religious outreach of, of either party. I mean, I think from the Democrats' point, point of view, um, you know, particularly with with uh, Barack o o Obama in the White House, there's a huge confusion in the in the electorate about his religious commitments. And so this is about signaling to the portion of the electorate that that that's kind of on the fence. So I mean, in, in many ways, it's not uh, it's not so much about policy, which is not to say that the president's uh, beliefs don't influence policy. It's, it's just this is about from a strictly political point point of view telling a certain kind of voter that it's okay to support him or that's okay to vote for this candidate because, you know, they, they share something. They, they have a shared set of values, even if the policy priorities are, you know, do not match up in a kind of one to one ratio. Right. But I think what we're seeing, what you're saying is what we're seeing this cycle is even less of, of that, you know, so there's, there's definitely less of the overt uh, religious appeals, I think. Or at least there's a lot less of the events that are focused around right. uh, making overt religious appeals to Catholics, and it, I think they did a little bit of this with the evangelicals in 2008. Um, oh, yeah, no, I mean it's, it's a much the the oh, the Obama campaign seems to have really slimmed down on its on its religious outreach. Um, and why do you and think maybe that is? sorry? Why do you think that is? I mean, do you think that they've made a tactical decision that this really didn't doesn't help in terms of winning, or do you think it was more of a decision like this just isn't who, what we want to portray about ourselves? We want to be more, you know, we don't want to do this sort of targeted uh, religious outreach. It's like, oh, here we are today. We're talking to the Catholics, or today we're talking to the Methodists. Right. No, I um, think it's probably more, more the inclusive. former. I don't. I mean, I don't. You know, in presidential right. politics, it's. You, you, want to do what you can to win without completely selling yourself out. Uh, so I think, I think this is really, this is, this was a, a and I'm speculating here that, that this was a decision that, that was made um, about where to allocate the resources. And in this, right. and I think the Obama campaign just decided um, that it was going to have more luck on, on other voting uh, groups. But, you know, which is, but what's interesting, and maybe this is, you know, this has something to do with the contraception mandate. Maybe they, they, they thought, well, you know, this is our policy and it's not, you know, we're not going to connect with a certain segment of especially Catholic voters. So um, we're just going to make our argument and, they, you know, let the, let the chips fall. Um, but then in, in, in September, you, you know, the, these, these polls came out. There was that National Pew poll that's, that showed that Catholics were moving uh, away from Romney. And then mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, in a couple of important swing states, there was that same movement. Uh, and which is interesting because, you know, 
it's not as though the Obama campaign has, has really gone after Catholic voters. Now, there was the nuns on the bus tour, and there has been a good deal of, of coverage um, that, you know, that has been driven by third parties, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what kind of right. Catholic is Paul Ryan, what kind of Catholic is Biden. Um, yeah. And that could have, you know, that, that may move the needle a little bit. Um, but I think well, the Obama wonder, campaign has just, you know, decided that um, going after the, the Catholic vote in this particular season uh, wasn't worth it because I think at the beginning of the, of the campaign, they figured it was really going to be about uh, the president's argument on the economy and the way that he could steward that, that that, that issue would be driving the election. Now, that's shifted a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I, I just think, you know, it's got to be making some conservatives heads explode that Catholic <laughs> voters are starting to move away from Romney. I mean, especially after that uh, fortnight for, for freedom that the U.S. Catholic bishops ran. Yeah, and we talked about this the last time, and your, yeah. your uh, theory was that people in the pews were not responding uh, or reacting to the fortnight for freedom. And obviously there is, there is a segment of Catholic voters who were very rah-rah about the fortnight for freedom and loved it and got all energized about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, is it a pretty small segment of Catholic voters? Do you think? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the polling data has been strong on this for a while. It seems that if you are a Catholic who goes to church every week, you are more likely to vote conservative. Right. Um, if you go less than once a week, now, of course, this is this is a this is a piece of data that conservatives love um, because mm -hmm. it makes it look like you know only the best yeah, Catholics the devout ones. are right, right. voting for conservatives. Um, right. But if you go to church less than every every week, uh, even if you go three times a week, it starts to tilt in the other direction. So I do think you know I mean in my own parish there there were Fortnite for Freedom events. There was uh -huh. a, there was like an overnight vigil. Um, there, you know, we heard homilies, or not homilies, but sort of, uh, you know, at the end of the service, there would be a speech about it. Um, and so, and, you know, I just kind of like a prairie dog, I was kind of like sit up and look around and see what my fellow prisoners were thinking. Um, because, uh, you know, Catholics, they don't really respond well to being told how to vote by religious leaders. Um, well, so I, you know, you know I, there, there's a real, I mean, there's, there's no way to, no, but I think there's a real possibility that you know, the way the bishops played this uh, could backfire. Because they overplayed it. Possibly. I mean, it was a very, you know, it was a, it was a very concerted effort um, and in many ways a very expensive effort. Uh, and I, I haven't looked at the Form 990s yet, but I would be willing to bet there's a lot of Knights of Columbus money behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one thing that I've been thinking about, you know, look, if, if there was a pew, there was another pew survey of Catholic voters that came out last week. And, you know, some of the conclusions in the executive summary were kind of hilarious in that you know, liberal Catholics tended to be, you know, registered Democrats or lean Democrat. And conservative Catholics tended to be Republic, you know, re registered Republicans or lean Republican. Well, there's a surprise, right? And, right. Uh, and I just wonder, are Catholic voters even a thing, right? Because they're so... Uh, they're not nearly as homogenous as some other religious demographics. You know, if you look at evangel white evangelical voters, you know, there's something like, you know, 80, 70, 80 percent voting for Romney. Um, Jewish voters, there's something like, you know, 65, 70 percent voting for Obama. Um, you know, so, you know, that's kind of like people tend to look at those as uh, an unshakable Lock. Oh yeah, um, but I mean, some of that I mean, is just kind of it's just kind of like a hangover from the '60s. I mean, you know, <laughs> there, there, this has been something. You know, this has been an argument that come that comes up every four years, like but, but, but Catholic, and, but, but and most people we, who are we always get a whole series of, of, of pieces, that, and they all say you know, they all ask the same question: Is right. there a Catholic vote? Right. And most 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 sociologists will say, actually, no. Uh, there is no Catholic vote. There are Catholic votes. There are pieces of the Catholic pie that go here, go here, go here. Mm -hmm. um, but by and large, Catholics vote with the winner. I mean, and, that, and, that, and that's partly why there's, there's such a coveted, I mean, that is why, why there's such a coveted voting block. But the question of whether they are a block at all, um, I mean, it seems, seems like no. Uh, right, because I, I really you, wonder how many Catholic, Catholic, American Catholics are going, 
I'm going to decide who to vote for in this presidential election based on, you know, these Catholic considerations. I mean, it's just, you know, they're, they're, they're people, they're voters. They've got, they've got uh, a checkbook to balance. They've got a job to look for. They've got, you know, I mean, they're just people, uh, you know, it's so, like the whole idea that there's a, that there's a way of, of winning them over using religion is sort of, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, there's, there's no way to get the whole pie doing that, but. Or know, even, what? or even slice them away. I wonder, I wonder, you know, cause obviously, yeah, they're the, <coughs> they're the ultimate swing. Right, but <coughs> so, so you see, you know, the GOP or <coughs> Democrats will, will make a play on certain values. And the idea there is to break is, is to break off the values voters, you know, cause right. this is, you know, this is all about the margins and this is, I, I, right. I expect this will be a pretty close election, or at least this is what the campaigns are expecting. <coughs> and so they, you know, they want to figure out a way. And I think you're seeing some conservatives kind of start, especially Catholic conservatives kind of throw everything at the wall. You know, is this, is this going to work? Uh, you know, there could they, they see the polling data on, on Catholics uh, not going the way that they, they, they expected and they're kind of freaking out. Right. Um, and so they're, you know, we're going to try this. We're going to, we're going to try that. We're going to try this. And maybe, you know, in the districts where it's a slim, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a close race that could decide it. Right. Well, I mean, they're, they're clearly realizing that they've maxed out on certain constituencies. Like they've probably, probably maxed out on the, you know, the white evangelical vote. Um, and you know, they're, they're looking for these ways to slice away. So that's explains the, the oy vey Barack Obama billboards right. in Florida. Um, and explains these, right, which is so, <laughs> so yeah, funny. Oh my God. But one of the things that I want to talk to you about, cause you've written about it at Commonweal is this, uh, um, I don't know what to call it. Like a, a, a was it a, a letter uh, on all of our shoulders? Um, it was yeah. written or, or it was, it's a critique of Paul Ryan's economic policies from yeah. about 150 Catholic scholars and theologians. Uh, and, uh, and this came out, when did it come out? Did it come, it came out before the vice presidential debate. Yeah. It came out the right? day before. So it came out last week. Last right. Wednesday. And so of course, like, as, as we were saying, you know, Martha Raddatz asked them about, asked Biden and Ryan about their Catholicism with respect to abortion, but not with respect to these economic issues. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit also about how Robert George, who is advising the Obama, uh, I'm sorry, advising the Romney campaign. Definitely uh, not the, advising the Obama. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and the uh, and the Catholics for Romney uh, constituency um, came out uh, accusing that of being a very partisan attack on, on Congressman Ryan. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what's in the critique and then what, what George's reaction to it was. Sure. Um, so I think the signatories are, kind of, are up to like 157 now, and it's a bunch of Catholic theologians and, and scholars, um, not all of whom are flaming liberals, the, they will happily tell you. Uh, and they, they released this open letter called On All of Our Shoulders, a Catholic Call for the Endangered Common Good, um, which makes it sound like they're calling for the common good to be more endangered, but that's not actually what they want. Uh, and it's it's they a needed a copy editor, but anyway. Yeah, um, right. Uh, it's a it's a it's a strong critique of Paul Ryan's um, more libertarian colored policies, uh, especially with respect to you know cuts in in his budget to food stamps um, and his uh, his plan to change Medicare um, into at least part partly a, a voucher system, which he calls premium support. Um, and this which, is a critique from which sounds the like, you know, some kind of ladies' hosiery. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so but, but this is a sorry. critique from uh, from the uh, uh, Catholic yeah. theological perspective. Yeah, so not, the, not a critique. Just so based I mean, obviously, this is this is written by um, Catholic scholars. So there mm -hmm. are uh, so they they cite um, Pope John Paul II. They cite the current Pope um, in in the in the Pope's uh, and the church's, you know, constant teaching that the individual person, um, uh, should be best understood as a, as a, as a social creature so that, you know, it's not, it's not individualism, um, that, that animates, uh, Catholic theology with respect to the nature of the, of the human person, but, but 
Catholic, uh, the, the Catholic Church holds that we are always in relationship to other people and to God, obviously. Um, and so the authors of the statement critique, um, in part, uh, Ryan's policies, but also the way he's kind of held up Ayn, Ayn Rand mm -hmm. um, as the, the touchstone of his policies. Now, he's moved away from that. Uh, he, he gave a speech at, at Georgetown where he he asserted that it was really uh, Aquinas who inspired his, his uh, policy goals. Um, I'm sure that but, plays at Tea Party rallies all the time. Sorry? It was the Aquinas reference. It was really Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> And he, he, that's what, that's the speech he gives at a Tea Party rally? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, Aquinas plays big at the uh, Tea yeah. Party. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so, the, so this statement asks what I think is a pretty good question. If it's true that Paul Ryan has kind of moved away from his Randian uh, theories, right. and uh, then how, you know, how, well, then why haven't his policy aims changed? Um, and, and that's, so, and that's, that's really what the statement is about. It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a critique of individualism from a Catholic point of view. And that, I think, you know, a t totally good question about how Paul Ryan's policies have been affected by his shift from Rand to Aquinas. Uh, so, um, this so, is signed so, by, but, so like, how, how, how widely noticed was this, uh, was this critique? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I, I I'm not quite sure how to gauge it. I mean, it, it got picked up um, in several outlets. Uh, got picked up in the Washington Post because David Gibson uh, wrote on it for uh, Re Religion News Service, which is mm -hmm. a, a wire service that goes out to papers right. across the country. I mean, that's a pretty good pickup. Um, obviously, I mentioned it on Common Wheel. It got picked up uh, in, in various places, and it got picked up uh, in some conservative uh, blogs. Um, Especially by uh, Robert P. George, who's a, who's a conservative legal scholar um, and uh, an advisor to the Romney campaign, and he he complained on the First Things blog um, that ba basically that this that this statement on on all of our shoulders is a partisan document, uh, and his argument is that and the way that he believes that he he knows this that even though. The, the authors of this letter say that it's not partisan. Um, in fact, one of them, who's a Fordham professor, uh, said that he's not voting for either candidate. Uh, George's argument is basically that because they present Ryan's views in a kind of unfair way, that's, how, that, that's the tell. Um, but of course, uh, and this is what I wrote about on the Common Real blog, I think George is quite guilty of the same thing in his presentation of the uh, Obama Biden tickets policies, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of you know he 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 complains that this is a that you you know you can tell that these people are really partisans because they they don't they don't present their quote unquote opponents in the in the, in the best light. But in fact, you know that's exactly what George does. Well, so so for people who are watching this and don't know who Robert George is, so he's a professor at Princeton, and he's also um, you know like you said he's an advisor to the Romney campaign. He he was one of the founders or the founder of the American Principles Project, which is a conservative advocacy type organization, or maybe it's a nonprofit, but it, it advocates conservative, uh, conservative ideas. And he is also, I think, perhaps best known or, you know, well known for being one of the authors of the Manhattan Declaration, which was the 2009 document, which brought together Catholics, evangelicals, and Orthodox Christians um, that in basically saying this was something that in a way seemed to lay the groundwork for be a blueprint for the later uh, religious freedom wars that we saw late last year and this year, um, basically saying that the religious freedom of Christians is under attack by uh, same-sex marriage and reproductive rights and maybe some other things like, you know, gay adoption, etc. And uh, that it might at some point become necessary uh, to preserve religious freedom for Christians to engage in civil disobedience uh, against complying with these laws, which is something that some of the Catholic institutions who are objecting to the contraception mandate are, are threatening to do, you know, right. not comply with it. And then they're Although it's not, you know, it's, you know, it's a very 
stirring, you know, call um, uh, with, you know, echoes of the civil rights movement. But in fact, it's not really clear to me what it would mean to disobey civilly the contraception mandate. I mean, right. or, or um, even, you know, like the New York State Gay Marriage Law, which has pretty strong protections for uh, religious groups. Right. So if you're um, a religious group in, in New York, you don't have to, you don't, no one can make you perform a same-sex ceremony. So what's your, what's your civil right. disobedience well, going to be? just as no one, you know, the state could not force a Catholic priest to uh, preside <laughs> over the wedding of, of a divorced uh, couple. You know, right. that, it's the same sort of thing. Or couldn't um, force somebody to force a clergy person to preside over the wedding of people of a different faith. Right. You know, it's like they can't. And and with the, uh, but, you know, I have heard with regard to the contraception mandate, there are some, I think it was the president of the Catholic University of America was basically saying, you know, look, if we don't comply with this and we have to pay these penalties that the uh, IRS is going to impose on us under the law, it's going to put us out of business, um, which raises questions of, you know, well, which yeah, is, I mean, uh, we're putting your like, entire educational mission or that, uh, but but anyway, but I I, I I gave all that background just in terms of who is who is Robert George and where is he coming from at this, and that his concerns seem more or, oriented towards objecting to the Obama Biden ticket because of same sex marriage, abortion, the contraception right. mandate versus these objections, which are really quite different. To uh, to Paul Ryan's economic policies. Yeah, right. Um, and and of course, you know, this is the this is the part in the debate when uh, certain conservative Catholics will say, well, you know, these issues, um, abortion and gay marriage. Um, uh, what's the third one? The you know that the, the, these are not um, that these these are these are, these are about intrinsic evils, and so um, because the, the the way that their thinking goes, according to the Catholic theology, when something is intrinsically evil, um, it's it, it you know it, it makes it easy to decide that it's wrong. Um, whereas a question of economic policy, uh, these conservative Catholics would would say, uh, involves uh, a prudence. So you you need to kind of figure out which policy is closer to Catholic teaching. Um, but it's not you know it's not intrinsically evil to cut food stamps. Um, and now, do you whether, agree with that? I mean, as a Catholic person, do you agree with that? Oh no! I mean, I think no. The the, the GOP. I mean, it's you from the point of view of, a, of of Catholic teaching. Just because something is 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 gravely wrong um, doesn't it doesn't mean that it's more important than any other issue. It just means okay. um, that it is it is an objectively evil act, as as the as as, as Catholic teaching would put it. Um, but it doesn't. I mean, you know. This came up in the in the in the VP uh, debate. Um, Paul Paul Ryan said that you know he he uh, you know his his ticket um, does not does you know would not advance um, any kind of Catholic teach. I mean it wouldn't it, it wouldn't reflect Catholic teaching perfectly because according to Catholic teaching, abortion is wrong always. Um, but the, but the Romney Ryan ticket holds that you know it it should be it should be legal in, uh, and, and, and paid for with federal dollars in the cases of rape and incest and when the, the life of the mother is in danger. Uh, and that, and that's, a, that's a prudential judgment. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's reflected in the Hyde Amendment, which um, the U.S. Catholic bishops said that they, uh, they supported during the health care debate. Um, so, you know, you can, and from, you know, for Catholic voter who, who votes, you know, on, on these issues, you know, she or he might say, okay, well, this isn't Catholic teaching, but, but, you know, this doesn't reflect Catholic teaching perfectly, but I'm going to cast my vote for Romney Ryan because this is, this is better, or this is closer to Catholic teaching. Um, just as a, a, another Catholic voter who believes, you know, that feeding the, the, the hungry is, 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 is the most important issue would vote for Obama Biden possibly because they believe that their economic policies are, are more likely to put you know food in hungry people's mouths. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, what about this question of what the role of the government is? Because I think that you know not that I'm playing devil's advocate on Robbie George's behalf, but I mean I think the conservative 
rejoinder is that this is not about whether we care about the poor or not. It's about it's a question about the size of government and what the role of government is. Right. Um, that's that's actually something that comes up in in on all of our shoulders. Uh, the authors um, are right to point out that the Catholic teaching is not that government should be as small as possible. In fact, Catholic teaching has been quite clear for decades and decades that the government does have a, have a role in ensuring the common good. And so um, the authors of the statement point out that um, you know, it's, not, it's not Catholic teaching that government needs to be tiny even though there, there is in, in Catholic teaching the notion that the, you know, the most local level of, of uh, change, whether it's through government or you know, personal charity, that that's preferable. And that's just, that's the, you know, that's just a, a common part of Catholic teaching um, about being you know, close to uh, the decisions that are there. So people on the ground know- But it's not an argument for air. cutting government. But of course, yeah. on it's something like healthcare, um, you know, it's not something that, you know, it, in effect, you need larger, larger governing bodies in order to, to address that problem, because by its very nature, it's, um, you know, it, it, it includes all of us. Um, so, yeah, I think, and I think at one point in time, Paul, Paul Ryan, you know, he, he actually, it was a very good line. He said, you know, the, the church's preferential option for the poor is not a preferential option for big government. Right. And literally, that's true. But, but when you actually have to apply Catholic thought to the question of poverty, um, you, the, the, the question that you have to answer is, what is the best way to alleviate this suffering? And for a lot of Catholics, I, you know, I don't think they deny um, that the government has to have a, a role there. Um, and shrinking it to the point where you're um, cutting food stamps uh, doesn't doesn't satisfy the you know the, the command that that we serve the the least of these. So I mean, is this a conversation that I mean, this whole question of uh, Paul Ryan uh, and, and and the Republican Party and the conservative movement touting Ryan's faith and his devout Catholicism as a selling point, right? Um, but that. On these questions, uh, his policy may be in conflict with what his faith teaches. I mean, you know, in the same way that the the um, conservatives argue that Biden's policy positions on abortion and same sex marriage are in conflict with what his church teaches. I mean, should should non Catholic voters care? I mean, is it is it a question of is it a question of uh, Paul Ryan? Paul Ryan is a hypocrite, or is it a question of Paul Ryan is mangling Catholic teaching by attempting to uh, bolster his his credentials with voters by saying he's Catholic when in fact it's you know he's in conflict with Catholic teaching? I mean, is this something that that should matter to voters, even Catholic voters, as opposed to it mattering to Catholics as they discuss? What yeah, well, I mean, I seriously, these, doubt that, I, I seriously doubt that non-Catholic voters who aren't already interested in those issues, you know, abortion, gay marriage, um, social justice issues, you know, I don't think it's going to matter to those voters whether Paul Ryan is a good Catholic on those issues or Joe Biden is a good Catholic on, on those issues. Uh, for Catholics, you know, I, I don't think the authors of on, on all of our shoulders would say that Paul Ryan is a hypocrite. In fact, I'm pretty sure they would, they would not say that. I think that, I think what they would say um, is that he is sincerely but wrongly putting forward a certain view of the human person um, that does not comport with the, the Catholic teaching on the nature of the human person, which is social. Um, and and that, that's why the statement talks about Ryan's you know strong support for Ayn Rand's philosophy. Um, and if you go you know go on YouTube and Look at some of the interviews that she did, you know, with Johnny mm -hmm. Carson, with Phil Donahue, with Mike Wallace. I mean, she, from my point of view, presents, you know, she she comes off as kind of a, a, a moral monster. I mean, she she believes that charity is a sign of weakness. Um, now, I don't, I, I really doubt that Paul Ryan would agree with that, and and, and obviously she was a she was a serious atheist, and so he he would reject that too. Um, 
But the fact that he's expressed such strong support as recently as 2009, when he, he made this campaign video, which is still up on his Facebook page, right. you know, in which he kind of held up the morality of the individual um, as what's most important. Um, you know, I, that, that it's perfectly fair to ask him that if, if you, you know, if, if this is something that you've pledged yourself to as a kind of touchstone for your, for your, for your own policies, then where, you know, where's, and, and you've shifted to Aquinas, where, you know, where's the beef? Like, how, how do we know this? Right. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, there are people out there, uh, loud people out there who somehow get to talk for Catholics, to speak for Catholics. I mean, I don't know that I even put Ravi George in that category. He's kind of more of a conservative activist, although, you know, I think he does purport to speak for Catholics and evangelicals who are aligned on these issues. Um, but I'm thinking of somebody like Deal Hudson, who this week talked about, or not, not this week, last week, or the week before, maybe. No, he's, he's actually uh, still talking about this. But go oh, ahead. he's still talking about it. Okay, so I can say this week is still talking about um, this this claim that the Obama campaign is, is uh, doing phone banking uh, anti-Mormon phone banking, uh, or Bill Donahue, who, you know, he's, he's kind of the favorite go-to Catholic, uh, for reporters to quote, but I mean, I yeah, think well, Donahue gives good quotes. I mean, he just, he's like yeah. made for, for, for this. He's, yeah. and I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons that Donahue is so prominent, um, is his willingness to say really outrageous things. Um, he's very provocative. Uh, you know, he will, he, he loves, you know, sticking, you know, jabbing a stick in the, in the, in the cage of the politically correct media. Um, and so, and, and also I think a lot of it has to do with the rise of, of TV news. Um, you know, there, there's a real need, uh, to fill 24 hours of, of air time and he's great on TV. I mean, I think he's, I think he's not, uh, he's not the kind of person I want to represent, uh, Catholics, um. But he's a main, you know, he's, he has, uh, it's, it, it blows my mind. He, you know, he, he has like a huge salary, right? He gets paid like $350,000 a year. He um, does? Yeah, it's, it's huge. Uh, so, and they, they have like a three or $4 million budget. Maybe it's two or two or three. Uh, and, and, but as far, as far as I can tell, like his job is basically to, to look around on the internet, find things to get mad about. Uh, to dictate a press release to someone who works for him, who then who then types it up and sends it out to media people like us, and then he ends up on TV, kind of parroting these very outrageous statements, um, and and that's what passes for Catholic analysis. I mean, it's 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 kind of a shame. And he was very happy to parrot um, that story by Deal Hudson. Uh, Claiming right. that, okay, so that, that there, uh, the Obama campaign itself was uh, making these these push polling calls, uh, asking asking Catholics uh, how you could vote for a Mormon who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, um, which which would be very offensive if it actually happened. Uh, right. Unfortunately, there you know there's there's no recording, and the the claim that Hudson makes uh, it relates to one person. There is one person. Uh, named Joy Allen, uh, who lives in the Pittsburgh area, who claims that she received two phone calls um, and that, that that there was a script um, that asked that offensive question about Romney. And she went on Fox and Friends uh, last week, last Thursday morning, I think. And um, she couldn't be bothered to return my two phone calls to her, uh, but she was happy to go on Fox, Fox and Friends, which is a pretty friendly... Uh, Right. show obviously for for the the kind of line that she's pushing and you know she, she went through telling her story about how she had received these two calls the first one uh the, co the caller was asking for her daughter uh and she explained that there was no way that her daughter who was a practicing catholic was going to vote for obama and then she you know gave the kind of thumbnail sketch uh um, she had all of the talking points you know abortion stem cell research gay, gay marriage uh, religious freedom um, and then the next week she claims she got a call, another call from 
she, she what I haven't been able to figure out is whether it was a different person. Um, she, she, you know, was it, bo both of these callers she says were women. Could it be the same woman? Yes. Could it be that it never happened? Yes. But because she has no recording of it, right? Um, and nobody else has come forward with. No, no. This. I mean, but right. but Deal Hudson is 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 you know writing on his website like you know every day or every couple of days trying to you know claim that the Obama campaign is making these uh, offensive push push calls. Of course, the Obama campaign has denied this, and they have said you know there's no. And it would be politically foolish. So th th this is one of one of the reasons why I'm dubious about about the, the woman's claims. I think it would be politically foolish uh, for there to you know be any kind of official operation where the Obama campaign is saying, "Yeah, we want you to call people and say offensive right. things about Romney's religion." That's what we right. want you to do. That's not happening. I mean, right. is it possible that there's some you know rogue uh, Obama volunteer who's who's going off script? Um, yeah, is it possible <coughs> that? Um, you know, it's the same person. Yeah, but is there some concerted effort by the campaign? That that, that just sounds insane to me. <coughs> so where is where is Hudson writing this? Uh, on a on a, this website called Catholic Online, mm -hmm. which I hadn't seen uh, until a few weeks ago. But this is his own website. It's not. It is, and he's he's yeah. kind of come back to life in in PA. He runs this thing called the the Pennsylvania Catholics Net Network, and. Uh, you know what's what I find really intriguing about this story that that he's pushing is that it came out on the day that Pennsylvania uh, polling data showed the Catholics were moving away from Romney. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so that was September twenty sixth, and that same day, you know, the story comes out that um, you know is uh, it, you know, might give certain Catholic voters pause. Uh, if they believed it, I, uh, and, and again, since we have no recording um, and no one else has come forward to, to, to say that they've received such calls, I'm, I'm seriously dubious that they have actually happened or that no, they're actually Deal, some kind of concerted effort. Deal Hudson did Catholic outreach for George George W. Bush, right? Yes. I mean, he was and, really the one who kind of, um, he's the one who, you know, when, when he was editing Crisis Magazine, um, he he's the, he's the one who kind of said, hey, you know, look at look at look at the the Catholic polling data. Look at who's who the church going Catholics are voting for, and so he you know that he was the one who really kind of devised that that strategy, um, which was smart. Uh, and and he was a very you know very very influential player um, with uh, with the Bush administration's outreach to Catholics, and that went on during you know during the uh, during the the. Uh, the, the, the time when Bush was in the White House, it, it, it wasn't just. But, the then, but then there was some scandal. There were some scandals surrounding. And him. yes, there were. <laughs> George too um, was uh, on those faith calls that the, the Bush White House had. Right, but oh, but the scandal <laughs> involving Hudson had something Hudson. to do with sexual harassment when he was teaching at a university. Yeah, right? um, I forget when the story came out. I think it was two two thousand five. It, it, it came out that. Um, he had uh, the, he had left Fordham after there were allegations of um, sexual harassment. I'm not sure what to call it. The this, the story um, the story was basically that according to this report that that Deal Hudson had taken a, a college freshman out for drinks um, for Fat Tuesday for Mardi Gras, um, and that the, the two of them had 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 a lot to drink and had some kind of sexual contact. I don't know what the details are. I was actually a student at Fordham at that time um, and, and knew that the young woman who, was, uh, who, who made those claims against him. And I didn't know why she left Fordham until I read that story. It's weird. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, but he, was he ever disciplined at Fordham over that? Um, or this was just a story that came out when I, he was working what, for the birth of If I'm remembering the story, I haven't read it, you know, for like seven years, but, uh, from what I recall, there was some, according to the story, there was some kind of, you know, agreement that Fordham made with him to leave. Uh, mm. So, so, so he was disciplined by the university. I, I, I think he actually had tenure, um, and it was after that, after he left Fordham, that he went to mm. found uh, or to, to Crisis Magazine, which, was, mm -hmm. which is a now defunct uh, conservative Catholic um, monthly. Okay, interesting. But, it's, but yeah. it, is, it is it is really you know he's got it's kind of amazing how he's you know you're starting to see him quoted in uh, 
you know, major papers. Uh, but he's a, you know, he's a very smart guy and he has, um, you know, he's working hard to get his candidate elected. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's part of the, part of the game plan is to, is to, um, push this idea that the Republican party is more aligned with what Catholics or at least what devout Catholics. Sure. I mean, and, and he's, you know, he's, it was, it was clever to, 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 to target what would, you know, doubtless be a very important state, you know, and set up shop right. there. Um, right, right. But I do kind of, you know, I sense a little bit of desperation um, <laughs> from the frequency uh, of his blog posts or press releases. You know, I get them in, uh, in my inbox every couple of days, you know, f just flogging this story about these push calls that seem mm. pretty hard to believe, but it's like, you know, he's been doing it for a couple of weeks now. Uh, mm -hmm. And it hasn't been picked up by the major media. I mean, you, you could even see it in the, in that Fox and friends, uh, the, the, you know, those are, that's a, that's a conservative show. And um, they, you know, they even kind of seemed like they want to make sure that it was the Obama administration statement that, that, or the Obama campaign statement that, that was the last word, um, even though they had to keep prompting Joy Allen to actually get to the Mitt Romney Mormon stuff. Um, she seemed more exercised by the fact that, um, you know, a practicing Catholic could never vote for Obama for X, Y, and Z reasons. All right. So we've come to the lightning round. And the question is, uh, second wild card, good or bad for Major League Baseball? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's very, oh, God. Um, <laughs> no, my, 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 my heart aches because... Grant is a White Sox fan, uh, so everybody yeah. be gentle. They were in first place for, like, almost the whole season. Why do they do this to me? It was so great. You know, we had Rob and Ventura in there managing after Ozzy Guillen took his family to Miami. Thank Jesus. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, I... I the argument for Bud Selig is that, who's the commissioner, um, is that, you know, these one-game playoffs for the for the second wild card are very, you know, fans love it. Um, but, okay, yeah, I, I ended up, I'm an Orioles fan. I ended right. up loving sorry, it, right? Sorry, okay. sorry so, about yeah. the Orioles. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know, because it just seems like such a stupid way to, to decide right. for these you know, if you're going to play 162 games and then have your whole season ride on one, um, it just seems sort of... No, I mean, but... and baseball is not football. You, know, you don't decide who the better team is on the basis of one game, you know, because you have a pitching staff and, right. you know, your team is made up of a lot of different components. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a reason it's such a long season. There's a reason that uh, you can't advance to the next round of the postseason without winning at least three games and then at least four and then, and then four at the, at the higher levels. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this new playoff system looks a lot more like the old playoff system. Uh, but at the same time, I kind of, you know, it feels a little cheap. Like it feels like, you know, if, you know, like let's say Derek Jeter broke his ankle, you know, before you know, let's say that the Yankees were in the in the one game playoff, and Jeter had broken his his ankle the day before that game. Well, that that game, or he had injured, he had, you know, he had like a you know bad back or something. You know that that one game would be decided, uh, or that 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 one game would would decide the fate of the of the team. When you know, if if it, if it were stretched out over five games, maybe his back would get better. I mean, his ankle wouldn't heal, but um, well, you know, I well, I. I I'm not going to feel sorry for the Yankees in your hypothetical. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame um, you. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> but I don't like the Yankees. Know, I do have to say that it did make the season really kind of interesting and exciting, like all the different permutations of who was going to be where. I mean, in the end, right. uh, you had uh, you know questions about whether it was going to be the Yankees or the Orioles uh, winning the division. And really, at the end, more surprisingly, uh, whether the Rangers or the uh, A's were going to win the West. And it was just, it, it was kind of exciting and fun. Uh, but I felt a little played, though, because it was obviously just like this 
ploy to make yeah. it exciting like it's that. Cheap. It's cheap. It's super, super <laughs> um, cheap. Who are, you, who, are you, who are you picking for the uh, series? Well, you know, I think the Tigers are going to uh, beat the Yankees. Um, well, no, yeah. I mean, without Yeah, without now that seems pretty evident. And, uh, and also just, you know, with the slump that uh, – Granderson and and uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Cano. Uh, Cano, I mean, right? Amazing. I mean, uh, amazing. you know, it's just it's just kind of um, you know unbelievable. And actually, the series between the Orioles and the Yankees was unbelievable for the absence of hitting uh, on both by both teams. Um, so I really do think that the that the I predict the the Tigers will beat the Yankees, and I don't know I don't know about the National League. Uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, both teams are coming in with riding this great momentum of right. you know, the, the Giants having a comeback from the two-game deficit against the Reds and the Cardinals uh, beating the Nationals in that just unbelievable uh, ending to that last game of their series. So total collapse. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't know that I have a. I, don't, I, I can't predict the, the National League. What do you think? Well, it's weird because it's like, you know, I, I, I think it's not, you know, the powerhouse clubs kind of didn't make it through the, the National League. Um, you know, but I think, yeah, I, you know, the Reds were very, very strong. Uh, the Nats obviously were really, really, really owning for a while. Um, so, yeah, I guess I would go with the Cardinals because um, – I believe they have made a deal with the devil to be in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, I don't know if you've ever been to, to Bush Stadium, but it's just like yeah. when you when you when you sit there and you see all of the pennants. I mean, I mean, it's just it's it's mind blowing. They yeah. they they know how to win. Um, yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would love to see Detroit win the whole thing because I mean, now that my team is out of it, uh, you know, it just seems like uh, the it would be a, just a nice boost for that city. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a bit of a moral quandary because, you know, I'm a White Sox fan. The, the, the Tigers are in our division. The Tigers yes. beat us. Um, but I really hate the Yankees. Like, I really hate, like, with a white hot fury. I hate that. I, I just, they're... But now I kind of feel bad because, you know, Jeter broke his ankle and I don't know. I guess my allegiance to the Midwest is going to is going to decide this for me, and I think Detroit needs it. I mean, I know Detroit needs it more than New York needs it. Yeah, it's just All amazing right, well, to me. Like, how, like how did the Tigers maintain that that payroll? That is what blows my my, my mind. I mean, Prince Fielder, Prince Fielder's hair—that's a whole other thing you have to put in your <laughs> your budget. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. This yeah, was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Always okay. is. Bye.